Father, thank you for an opportunity to hear songs about you. Certainly there is no one else in this universe worthy to be sung about like you and to praise like you. Thank you for eternal life. Father, it's a blessing to be able to go through this book of John and see not only you going to the cross, but what you endured to be able to, 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 go, to go to the cross. Lord, it's just amazing to me that by the time your hour got here, you were still willing to die for sinners. And what they had done to you had not turned you away or had not made you any less willing than when you got here. Thank you for that. And would you meet with us this morning and give us the help that we need from your book and the encouragement and instruction that we can get here. And uh, that only comes from you, Lord, not from me, not from anyone else, but from you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, what we have here in John 17 is a prayer. The entire chapter is a prayer uh, of Jesus Christ to his Father. Um, it's, uh, the, the, it's the longest, excuse me, it's the longest recorded prayer by Jesus Christ. And uh, it's an amazing thing. Uh, chapters 14, 15, and 16 is all Jesus talking, but it's to his disciples. And now Jesus speaks to his Father. Now, this is an amazing thing. Um, there's, um, there's a lot of uh, people in this world that would like to be in on, be a fly on a wall when the elite people of this world meet together. Whoever you think the elite people are, whoever you think the people that are really running the show and really calling the shots, when they meet together in their private secret meetings, some people would really, they just really, really want to know what they're talking about. And they'd love to be a fly on the wall and to hear that conversation. And um, uh, to be honest with you, to be 100% honest with you this morning, I, while I think that would be interesting, I'm really not all that interested in it because what we have in John 17 is far greater than the people of this world meeting together and talking together. What we have in John 17 is the Son of God in prayer to His Father. Now that's pretty amazing that we get to get in on that and what they're talking about. Wow, if the Son of God was to talk to His Father, what would He say? In John 17, we have what He said. Now, the majority of the prayer in John 17 is about us. He's praying for us. In the first few verses, He, he prays for Himself a little bit, but the vast majority, as we'll see, Lord willing, cover the chapter this morning, is, is about you and about me. That's, that's even more amazing, because were you to be able to listen in on one of those secret meetings with the elite people of this world, I guarantee they wouldn't be talking about you. And if they were talking about you in a generic sense, it would only be how they could exploit you or use you or destroy you. But we have the prayer of the Son of God to His Father, and we get to listen in. If God the Son was talking to God the Father, what would they be talking about? And they're talking about us and praying for us and how they can help us. It's, a, it's an amazing, amazing thing. But John 17, verse number 1, the Bible says, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven. Now before we get into what he actually says here, I want you to take notice. It says, when he prays, he lifted up his eyes to heaven. Now, in the Bible, there's no direct command as to how to pray. There's lots of examples of uh, some people kneeling, some people on their face, uh, some, some people just doing a variety of things. There's no specific way or, or position you have to be in to pray. But the fact that Jesus is looking up to heaven when he prays, I think, tells a lot. Because you know what it says? It says he has 100% clear conscience. Come on, how many, hasn't there been times in your life where you go to pray and you, and you get down and you just, you just, let me just bury my head as far down as I can go because I need to talk to the Lord and I want to talk to the Lord, but I recognize I have no right to talk to Him how, after how I've lived in the last 24 hours or the last week or last month or whatever the case is. You bow your head and say, I am not worthy to look your way right now, Lord. But Jesus... He's about to pray, and he looks right up into heaven. You know what that is? That's 100% clear conscience. I can talk to you, Father, with a clean heart, with a clear conscience. I have nothing to hide. I'm not ashamed. I will talk directly to you in prayer. 
He is absolutely righteous, 100% holy. Go back with me to Psalm 40. Psalm 40. If you, if you don't know what I was just talking about, I, I, would, I would be a little concerned. Is there no conviction in your heart? Is, have, you, have you gone that far that there's, there's no shame anymore, anymore for your deeds? I hope that's not the case. Look at Psalm 40, verse number 11. Psalm 40, verse number 11. Withhold not thou thy tender mercies from me, O Lord, let thy, now, why would you need mercies? Obviously, because you've sinned. Withhold not thy tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let thy loving kindness and thy truth continually preserve me. For innumerable evils have compassed me about. Mine iniquities have taken hold upon me. Watch, watch what it says next. So that I am not able to look up. They are more than the hairs of my head. Therefore, my heart faileth me. The psalmist here says, Psalm of David here, he says, so much iniquity, so much sin, I dare not even look up. Lord, I need your mercies, but I'm not even looking your way because I'm ashamed. Now what did Jesus do? He talks to his father, looks right up into heaven. Looks right past, uh, right past second heaven, just right up into heaven. I can talk to you freely, Father. I have, there, no sin. Look at Job 22. Job 22. From the very beginning of Jesus' prayer in John 17, we see His righteousness and His holiness. Job 22, start in verse 22. Job 22, 22. Receive, I pray thee, the law from His mouth, and lay up His words in thine heart. If thou return to the Almighty... Now, why would you have to return to the Almighty? Obviously because you've departed from Him. You've left Him. So, if thou return to the Almighty, thou shalt be built up. Thou shalt put away iniquity far from thy tabernacles. See, that's what you have to do to return to the Lord. You're not going to bring your iniquity with you and return to the Lord. You have to return to the Lord. You have to leave the iniquity behind. So thou shalt put away iniquity far from thy tabernacles. Then shalt thou lay up gold as dust, and the gold of Ophir as the stones of the brooks. Yea, the Almighty shall be thy defense. See, these are all the blessings you get from repentance. See, people want to hold on to their sin, but while they do, they're holding their own, own selves back from all these blessings the Lord wants to give you. Verse 24 again, what are you talking about? Verse 24, thou shalt lay up gold as dust. Don't, didn't the Lord promise you could lay up gold and silver and precious stones and at the judgment seat of Christ? Absolutely. Verse 25, Yea, the Almighty shall be thy defense. You want God back on your side? You get back on His side. And thou shalt have plenty of silver. Now, verse 26, For then shalt thou have thy delight in the Almighty and shall lift up thy face unto God. So this person has repented. They have returned to the Almighty. They put iniquity far from them. And what is one of the great benefits? I can look up to God now and not be ashamed. You know, as long as you're holding on to sin, as long as you're holding on to iniquity, as long as the Lord is dealing with you and dealing with you and dealing with you and you won't get rid of it and you won't get rid of it, you're going to have a hard time looking up to God. You might pray, you might talk to him, but you don't have a clear conscience. And verse 26 says, that, and Then thou shalt have thy delight in the Almighty. See, iniquity removes the delight from the relationship. You still have a relationship. You'll never lose that relationship, but the delight is gone because you won't give up your sin. And says, And shall lift up thy face unto God. Now that's for you and for me. Jesus Christ never had to return. He never left. And he could lift up his eyes to heaven because he was 100% sinless, 100% righteous. Now look at verse 27. Thou shalt make thy prayer unto him, and he shall hear thee. And thou shalt pay thy vows. You know, everything that Jesus prayed for, the Father's going to hear him. Not only because he's God, but because he's absolutely righteous. Now go back with me to John 17. John 17, verse number 1. 
These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. The hour is come. Now, just again, just take that phrase, the hour is come. That's an amazing statement. That's not just for three and a half years, the hour has finally come. That's not just for 33 and a half years, the hour has come. That's since Adam sinned in the garden and the Father and the Son agreed together that the Son would go and die for our sins. Finally, after 4,000 years, give or take, of human history, Father, the hour is come. The Bible says the Lamb was slain from the foundation of the world all that time. All those pictures in the Old Testament, all those shadows, they all pointed to a future day, and now that day has come. Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. You know, Jesus Christ had a glory after he came to this earth and ascended back to heaven that he did not have prior to him coming down to this earth. Oh, he had glory before the world was. We'll talk about that in a few verses. But there's an additional glory he gets after coming down here. Get two places. Get Hebrews chapter 2 and Philippians chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2 and Philippians chapter 2. We'll start with the Hebrews passage. Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things, and by, by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Jesus Christ, after he came down and tasted death for every man and ascended up, the Bible says he was crowned with glory and honor. He is not just the Son of God, as if that was just a just. He is the Son of God that came down here and died and paid for our sins. And there's a glory that he gets for doing that, that he never had before. Before Calvary, everybody could praise the Lord. All, saints could always praise the Lord, but we have something extra to praise him for now, don't we? For shedding his blood. Look, before Calvary, they could always praise the Lord. Oh, you're great, you're wonderful, you're powerful, you care for us, that's true, you're loving, that's true, but they couldn't say, thank you, Lord, for shedding your blood for me, but we can that's more glory now that Jesus has now. Look at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2, verse number... Well, let's just read the whole... Uh, just jump back. Start in verse 5. Philippians 2, 5. Let this mind be, be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men... And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him. Well, wasn't he already exalted? Yes, he was, but he got an, ex an additional exaltation after he came down here and did what he did for us. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I don't know about you, I'm looking forward to that day when every mocker, every atheist, every infidel is forced to say, Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, and they're going to do it. I'm looking forward to that. But Jesus got an exaltation and a glory after he came down here and died to pay for our sins that he never had before. So go back with me to John 17. John 17. In verse 1 he says, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy, thy Son also may glorify thee. If you're saved, you became a child of God. You became a son of God. But you couldn't... <laughs> 
You couldn't say, glorify thy son. You couldn't say that part. That's for Jesus only. Verse number two says, As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. The power he had over all flesh was not to heal the body. It was not to heal your sicknesses, although that's all very well within his power. The power talked about here is the power to give eternal life. Praise the Lord for that. Because you might have a great life, you might have a bad life, you might have a mediocre life, but if you're saved, you've got the best life, you've got eternal life. And that's the most important thing. Verse 3, And this is life eternal, that they, they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So eternal life is not about works, it's about who you know. Uh, you, ever hear, you, ever hear, um, you ever hear people talk about, well, you've got to know someone to get in there. You got to know someone to get in that place. You got to know someone to have eternal life. You got to know Jesus Christ, but it's not reserved for a, 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 a few select people. Everybody is welcome. Whosoever will may come. Eternal life is about knowing God and knowing the Lord. Verse number four I have glorified thee on the earth. What a great statement to make when you get to the end of your life. You know, you and I, when we get to the end of our life, Look, Jesus Christ is the absolute mark and standard. We're, we're never going to hit that mark, but we should be getting as close as we possibly can. When you get to the end of your life, you don't want to be able to say, I have glorified myself. You want to be able to say, I have glorified the Lord. I have, I have lived my life for His glory. You know, you can do a lot of even good things, even right things, even spiritual things, but you can do them for your glory. When you get to the end of your life, whatever you've done, you want to be able to say in your heart and your conscience, I truly and honestly did this for the glory of God. I didn't do this for my glory. I didn't do this uh, for my social standing in the church. Everything I did, I really did it for God because I loved Him. That's what you want, that's what you want to be able to say. That's what I ought to be able to say when we get to the end of His life. And Jesus Christ, He's about to go to the cross. He says, I've glorified Thee. I've glorified thee on the earth. And then he says, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Again, that's what you ought to be able to say. That's what I ought to be able to say. You say, well, you know, that's, that's unrealistic. You know, Jesus could say that. Uh, don't you remember what Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4? He said, I have finished my course. You absolutely can and should finish. You ought to be able to get to the end of your life and say, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do, and I have glorified thee on the earth. 1 Peter 3.18, Jesus is the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. You know, the cross and everything that's possible because of it is only possible because Jesus Christ lived a sinless life. If he went to that cross and he sinned one time, there's no salvation, there's no forgiveness. We can only be saved because... Every day of his life, he glorified the Lord and he finished the work that the Father gave him to do. Verse number five says, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, which, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. How's that a statement for the deity of Christ? Now, this whole chapter shows his deity. You can pick out almost any verse that shows his deity, but what a statement to make. Before the world was, Father, I had glory with you. But here's, here's an amazing thing about this verse. And I'll explain why in a second. One of the reasons the Lord warns us so strictly and so harshly about sin is because once you sin, you can never take that back. Once you sin, you are going to reap what you've sown, once you sin, you can never undo that. You can get forgiveness. The Lord can help you with the consequences, but he's not going to be mocked. You're going to reap what you've sown. I'm going to reap what I've sown. And, and, and just use this in a variety of examples. When you're talking to your husband or your wife, you say something that's unkind. Do you realize you can never unsay that? You can never take that back. 
and you can get forgiveness and you can move on, but you know 100% it can never be the same as it was before you said it. You sin against your wife or your husband in some terrible way, you can move past that and you can get beyond that, but if you have violated that trust, you can never, ever get that back exactly the way as it was before. And so this is why the Lord warns us so strongly about sin is because once you sin, it's never going to be the same as it was. It can be good. It can be, the Lord can help you. I'm not saying give up. What I'm saying is once you sin, it's never going to be the same as once you hadn't sinned. That's why the Lord warns us so strictly about us, about it. Now here's what's amazing about this. What did Jesus say? Glorify thou me with thine own self with, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So what happened? Jesus Christ came into this world. He was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. Romans chapter 8 says, he lived in this world for 33 and a half years around sinners, around wickedness, the devil throwing everything he could at him. And when he gets to the, the end of his life, he says, Father, I want it to go back exactly the way as it was before I ever got here. Now, how could he say that? The only way he could say that is if he never sinned one time. The only way you could say, I want to go back to the way things used to be, is if you could, if you could erase those sins. None of us can do that. And Jesus Christ lived 33 and a half years, and when he got back to his father, it was the exact same relationship he had with his father before he got down here. Because he never sinned one time. What a Savior we have. What a Savior. And he says in verse number 6, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now when he says, I have manifested thy name, it's not just, it's not just the name, like just the word. It's, the name is everything associated with that name. When your name comes up in conversation, it's not just your name. It's everything about you comes to mind. And Jesus, and he says, I have manifested thy name. He showed who God is, not only by his words, but by his life. He manifested it. Unto the man which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me. In other words, they believed God already. They believed the scriptures already. And when Jesus Christ came, they kept his word. And so they, they did belong to God. They, were, they weren't atheists. They weren't unbelievers. They believed in God. They believed the scriptures. They belonged to the Father. And when Jesus Christ came, they believed on him. And they have kept thy word. Verse number 7 says, Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. Now, don't you like that? They have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. There's a whole lot they didn't get and they didn't understand. But Jesus gives them credit for this. Hey, they know that what I got was from you. They know that I came out from God. Aren't you glad that all you had to know was the gospel to be saved? Aren't you glad you didn't have to understand the entire New Testament to be saved? Matthew through Revelation, you want to get saved, you need to understand this. No, you just need to believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried, rose again the third day, and trust Him. And Jesus Christ says... I can't really say much about what they understood or what they got, but they at least got this. They know I came from you. I'll give them credit for that. And praise the Lord. That's what, that's what all was required for their salvation. Now, verse number 8 says, For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. Now, if you remember from chapter 16, it sounds almost contradictory to what he was talking about with his disciples. What, is, what does he say at the end of verse 8? They have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. Now, look back at chapter 16, verse number 29. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly, and speakest no proverb. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things... See, he said they were sure. They said we're sure. 
and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. And when Jesus is praying, he gives them credit for that. But when he's talking to his disciples in chapter 16, what does he say in verse 31? Jesus answered them, do ye now believe? He's questioning whether or not they actually believed it. They said, we're sure, we believe. And Jesus said, are you sure? Do you really believe? Verse 32, Before, behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and, ye sh and shall leave me alone, and yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. Now, here's what I like about this. When Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and they say, we believe and we're sure, he questions them on it. And he challenges them on it and, and, and says, do you really believe? Are you as sure as you think you are? Why? Because he's trying to teach them. He's trying to help grow their faith and increase their faith. But when he's praying to his father, he says, oh yeah, they're sure, they believe. And he gives them credit for it. Even though he questioned it when he was talking to them. Now, aren't you glad that for you to be saved and for me to be saved, it didn't take a lot of faith. It didn't take strong faith. It just takes took the faith as a grain of a mustard seed, and the Lord counted that for us believing Him. You, could, you came to the Lord, I don't know how sure you are, but all you had to be is enough, have enough faith to say, Lord, I believe, and He counted that. Despite the fact that He knew you'd go back, despite that He knew that you'd wander and waver on that later, the fact that you believe one time, He said, I'm counting that. Praise the Lord. That's all you had to believe to get saved. You had to believe it one time. Didn't have to be a lot of faith. Didn't have to be strong faith. The Lord was just looking for a little bit of faith as a grain of a mustard seed, and he counted it for you to save your soul. And Jesus, he questions his disciples on this very, very thing when he's talking to them because he's trying to teach them, because he's trying to grow them and increase their faith. But when he's praying for them, for his Father, he gives them credit for what they said they believed, because they b did believe in, a, in a, a small enough measure, and that's all it took. Praise the Lord for that. You know, when someone comes to the Lord in faith, and they really believe from their heart the gospel, the Lord doesn't say, well, how strong did you believe it? Well, what will it take for you to give that up? No, you believe? Okay, you're in. You're saved. Praise the Lord for that. But he says in verse 8, I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. Now look at verse 14. I have given them thy word. So verse 8 says the words. Verse, eight, verse 14 says the word. And it's very, very easy to say, I believe the Bible is the word of God. Very, very easy to say that. You believe the Bible is the word of God? Yeah, I believe the word of God. You believe that's true? Yeah, that's true. It's easy to say when you're not looking at anything specific. But when you open up to a certain chapter and a certain verse and say, do you believe this verse right here? Then you find out if you really believe it. And so the words make up the word. I'll show you, I'll show you this in Jeremiah. Look at Jeremiah 15. Jeremiah 15. A lot of people say they believe the Bible, but when you actually open it up, it's just carefully selected certain passages and certain verses they believe. But your, your success, again, your success as a Christian is going to be whether or not you not receive the word, but you receive the words. When the words cross your way of thinking and your way of living, will you receive the words or will you reject them? Look at Jeremiah 15, verse number 16. Thy words were found... And I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. So guess what? The words make up the word. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. Now you want, you want the word of God, you want the Bible to be a joy to you? a blessing to read, and you can rejoice in it. You've got to receive the words. You've got to consume the words and receive them and believe them. The reason why a lot of people can't get joy and rejoicing out of the Word of God is because there's words in there they won't receive. 
But if you'll receive the words, the word will be a joy. Now go back with me to John, John 17. John 17, verse number 9. I pray for them. And you know, to this day, he hasn't stopped praying for us. He ever lives to intercede for us. He prays for them. This prayer lasts 26 verses, but it's gone on. His prayer for us has gone on 2,000 years. Still praying, interceding for us. I pray for them. Now, before we get to the next part of the verse, I just want to focus on this. I pray for them. Not against them, not about them. I pray for them. And I've been in, I've been in quite a number of prayer meetings that have uh, really all it is is a sanctified gossip session. Oh Lord, this person needs help because, you know, he's involved in this. Or he's, really, the Lord doesn't know that. Pretty sure he knows that. Uh, how about praying for them? It, okay, if we have a prayer meeting, if you would pray one way if that person was there, but you would pray a different way if that person wasn't there, it's a good indication you're not praying the right way. Whatever you pray for someone, you should be able to say the exact same thing if they were there or if they weren't there. Oh, Lord, this person's clearly not doing, doing right. Would you say that if they were kneeling right next to you? Probably not. Probably not. Jesus prays for his disciples. Now, he knows lots and lots of things he could bring up that we're not doing right. But he prays for us, praise the Lord. And God the Father is sitting in heaven, and all day long, he's hearing Jesus Christ interceding on our behalf. And according to Revelation 12, day and night, the devil is the accuser of the brethren. He is accusing us all the time, day and night. So Jesus is always interceding. The devil is always accusing us. Now, I just ask you one question. Which side are you taking in that tug of war? Are you on the accusing side or are you on the interceding side? And Jesus said, I pray for them. Look at Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1, 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and, under, and spiritual understanding. Now, Paul could have said, you know, these people lack a lot of wisdom. These people don't really have a lot of standing, a lot of understanding, Lord. <laughs> or he could have said, Lord, would you please fill them with the knowledge of your will and spiritual understanding? <laughs> one's accusing, one's praying for the person. Verse number 10, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. O oh Lord, this person's not walking the right way. Would you please help them? Or you could say, Lord, would you help this person to walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing? Say, well, what's the difference? It's a big difference. It's a big difference. One, you're praying for the person. One, you're joining the accuser of the brethren. Go back with me to John 17. John 17, 9. I pray for them. It make a difference in your attitude, too. It's not just words. It's not just semantics. I pray for them. I pray not for the world. Now, this is stronger than just leaving the world out of his prayer. This is him actually specifically saying, I'm not praying for the world. <laughs> This is more than just omitting them. This is specifically saying, I am not praying for the world. Now, why would he, why would he say that? Why would he be so uh, emphatic on that? Why would he put such a, an emphasis on that? Well, because he wants to teach every one of us that it's a complete waste of breath to pray for the world. Why would you pray for the world? The world's going to go exactly as the Lord already said it would. It's going to end with the Antichrist rising to power. It's going to end great tribulation. It's going to end with Jesus Christ coming back on a horse to make war. Nothing you do is going to change that. Why would you pray about something the Lord already told you? I'm not answering that. That's going to go the way I already said it's going to go. 
every prayer for, Lord, make the world a better place. Lord, take all the wars away. You're just wasting your breath. Jesus said, I'm not praying for the world. Now, we pray for all men, 1 Timothy 2.1, pray for all men. You say, isn't that the same thing? No, it's not the same thing. Praying for all men is an acknowledgement that anybody can be saved. And so I don't know who's going to get saved. I don't know who's not going to save. So I'm going to pray for all of them because all of them can be saved. But I'm not praying for the world to be a better place because it's not going to happen. So we pray for all men, but we don't pray for the world. But for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now, how, now how, how is Jesus Christ glorified in us? Well, how did Jesus glorify his Father? Obedience. He kept his Father's commandment. He did what the Father sent him to do. How does Jesus Christ, how, are we, how do we give glory to him? By obeying him. By doing what he said to do. Verse number 11. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. So he's leaving, disciples are staying behind, I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name thou whom, those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. Now, the only person in the Word of God that's called Holy Father is the Father. <laughs> Jesus Christ, the Son of God, talking to his Father in prayer, calls him Holy Father. Now, Anybody here happen to know of a man who goes by that title, Holy Father? Yeah, that would be the Pope. That would be the Pope. Very, very blasphemous title to take. Jesus said, call no man upon earth your father. You're not even supposed to call them Father, let alone Holy Father. But this is, this is reserved for God the Father. Now, the Lord has a lot of different characteristics. But probably the one that describes him the most and the most complete is, is holy. And every single member of the Godhead has holy attached to their name. Here, here's the Father right here. What's the Father called? It's the capital H. That's his name. Holy Father. The Father has holy attached to his name. Look at chapter 14. Chapter 14, verse 26 but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Now go to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. All three members of the Godhead not only are said to be holy, but actually have the name holy as part of their name. That can't be said about any other trait. Acts chapter 3, verse number 13. The God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified His Son, Jesus, whom He delivered up and denied Him in the presence of Pilate when He was determined to let Him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life. Who is the Holy One? It's the Son of God. It's Jesus Christ. So all three members, the Father, the Holy Ghost, obviously, and the Son, they all have holy as actual part of their name. You think God cares about holiness? You think sin's not a big deal to Him? Holy is part of His name, every single one of them. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, they all have holy as part of their name. God values holiness. We ought to, too. Go back to John 17. John 17, Holy Father, verse 11, halfway through the verse, Holy Father, keep through thine own name. I'm, I'm satisfied. There's no, no other greater name than that. I'm, I'm satisfied. I'm kept through his name. If it was through another name, I'd have my, I'd have my doubts. But it's through his name, no doubts. I'm kept. Uh, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. So the Lord wanted unity in his body. 
before it ever began. He's praying, I want them to be one. I want them to be unified. I want them in one accord. We're, we're strong on separation from the world. We got that down pretty well, I think. But we need to be just as strong as unified for Christians. I think a lot of Christians, especially in our crowd, we're separated, but we're separated from any, everyone. We're separated from the world. We're separated from our brothers and sisters Christ. We're just separated from everyone. And Jesus said, no, I want you separate from the world, but, but amongst yourselves, I want you one. I want you unified. Verse number 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition. That's Judas Iscariot. Uh, if you look back at chapter 13, verse 26, 27, if you're taking notes, Judas Iscariot is the son of perdition. But that, look at that last phrase, that the scripture might be fulfilled. The most important thing you have is your soul. That's what Jesus is about to die for. He's about to go to the cross. He's about to die for sinners. But there's something more important than even a soul being saved and that's the scripture being fulfilled and if it's a choice as much as the lord loved you as much as the lord wanted to save you it's if it's a choice between you going to hell and the scripture being broken you'll just have to go to hell because the scripture will not be broken it cannot be broken now for us that are saved the lord will do a lot for you he really will I've seen him do it in my life. No doubt you could say the exact same thing. He will do a lot for you. He will be gracious. He will be merciful. He will help you. He loves you. One thing he will not do for you, he will not break his word for you. He will not break his word for you. If the Lord says you're going to reap what you've sown, that's what's going to happen. If the Lord says be sure your sin will find you out, that's what's going to happen. You don't mess with the word of God. As much as the Lord wants to save anyone and everyone... If it's a choice between saving a soul that he died for and the scripture being fulfilled, the scripture is going to be fulfilled. That's how important the word of God is. Verse 13 says, And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy, my joy, fulfilled in themselves. If you've been with us as we've studied the last few chapters, what what is one of the driving things the Lord's trying to get at? He's trying to get at the fact that, look, regardless of what your situation and circumstance is, you can have my peace and my joy and my love. And what does he say in verse 13? And now come I to thee. So God, the, Jesus is going to his Father. And these things I speak in heaven? No, and these things I speak in the world, that they, they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. You don't have to wait till you leave this world to have joy. He said, I am speaking these things in the world. My joy fulfilled in you is for when you are in the world. You can have it. And he's praying that you'll have it. So he gave them the instruction and how to get it in chapters 14, 15, and 16. And now he's praying that you'll have it in chapter 17. He wants his joy fulfilled in us. Verse 14, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Now, when someone gets to the end of their life, usually, if the, if the person has any sense at all, all the fluff goes aside. All the fluff goes aside. We're only talking about the things that matter the most. Now, Jesus Christ, he never had fluff to to lay aside. He was always 100% perfect and righteous, but he's at the end of his life, and he's talking to his father, and he says, I have given them thy word. It's like, there's nothing greater I could have given them, father. He's at the end of his life. He's talking about only the things that matter the most, and he says, father, I have given them thy word. Do you place as high of a value on the Word of God as the Lord does here? He's at the very end of his life, and he says, there's, Father, there's, there's nothing greater I could give them. I gave them your Word. I hope we value it, you value it, I value it, as much as apparently as the Son of God just valued it right there. 
In verse 15, he says, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. So he's praying. He's praying, I'm not taking you out of the world. I'm not, I'm not shielding you from the persecution. I'm not shielding you from the sin around you. I'm praying that you'll be kept from the evil. And it's possible. It's possible through the Lord's help. Sometimes it seems overwhelming, all this wickedness. But you can stand. You can stand through the Word of God, as we'll see in a second here. Look at verse 16. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Now, that's a statement of fact. Whether you're sanctified, whether you're separate from the world, if you're saved, it's just a statement of fact. You're not of the world. And that's why if you go back to the world, you can never enjoy it like you did before you got saved because you don't belong. It's been said by many preachers, not definitely not original with me, but once you're saved... You can never enjoy the life you used to live before you sin now that you're saved. Because the Holy Ghost is inside you the whole time telling you, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. The most miserable person in the world is a Christian who's not doing right. Lost person don't know what they're missing. They think it's all there is. They don't, they don't have a clue. You know what you're missing. You know the joy and the peace that you, that you could have, and you don't have it. And as much as you tell yourself it's, uh, that I'm fine, you know it's not. You're not of the world. Verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You say, well, how do I be separate from the world? You don't have to try to be separate from the world. You just dig into the word of God, and the word of God will do it for you. You dig into this book. You believe it, you obey it, you put it into practice. Separation from the world happens automatically because <laughs> they don't have anything to do with this word. They don't want anything to do with God or his book. But it says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The only way you're going to be sanctified is through the word of God. You can't just set out to say, okay, I'm going to be separate. I'm gonna... No, you've got to do it through the truth. You've got to do it through the word of God. You can't live a life pleasing to God without getting into this book. Sanctified. Verse 18, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. Everything we learned about Jesus being sent, that's not just for knowledge in your head. Oh, okay, that's how he was sent. This whole book is, and that's how you're sent also. Everything he's endured, all the opposition, everything. You're not just learning about Jesus Christ. You're learning about how to live your race and run your race because just in the same way as the Father sent the Son, He has sent you. So you're learning about Christ, but you're also learning about how to run your race because He sent us the same way as He was sent. Verse 19 says, And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Now, here's, here's, here's what's interesting. Verse 19 proves that sanctification is more than just separation from sin. Because Jesus never had to separate himself from sin. He never had any to begin with. And yet he said he sanctified himself. So obviously, sanctification is more than just departing from sin. Jesus never had any sin, but he sanctified himself. What is that? It's a life completely yielded to God for his use. Jesus came down here not to live his own life, not to do his own thing, but to do, fulfill everything the Father sent him for. So you can live a life that is clean. You can live a life that is pure. Praise the Lord for that, not, not knocking that. You're not actively sinning. But if your life is not yielded to God's use, you're not sanctified. Because Jesus sanctified himself. He never had any sin. Sanctification is more than just not sinning. It's my life is completely yours to use. And that's what he did. Verse 20, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Now, I like this verse. You know why? Because this verse says, you know what? This isn't just a prayer for my few disciples here. <laughs> this is a prayer for everybody who's going to believe their word and get saved. I like this verse because there's a lot of Christians that are escape artists. They know how to they know how to get out of everything 
That one, oh, that verse, I don't like that. That's for the Jew. I don't have to do that. Oh, that's not for this dispensation. That doesn't apply to me. And Jesus said, by the way, everything I'm praying for my disciples, I'm praying for you too, if you're saved. Verse 21, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. The world doesn't believe on Jesus Christ. Why? Because we're not one. Because we're divided. How many times do you witness someone? You say, how many times have you heard? How many times have you heard? If the Bible is true and you all claim to be Christians, why are there so many denominations? Why are there so many churches? Why can you not guys get along? Why can you not agree? And you can't explain to them that there's false doctrine, false apostles. They, you're wasting your breath trying, trying, to, trying to get that. But the world doesn't believe when we're divided. Look at chapter 13. Chapter 13, verse 34. 13.34 A new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another as I have loved you that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one to another. That's how the world knows that we belong to the Lord and that's how the world knows that Jesus Christ really is who he says, who he, says he is. When we're one, not divided, Back to chapter 17, 17, verse 22. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. Now, he hasn't given us glory in the sense that, you know, he's made us, like, sinless. But he's given us glory as, as he got in the sense that we have the ability and the capability to rise above sin. In other words, we can't say, Lord, you haven't equipped me enough. I don't have enough at my disposal. And the Lord says, I, I've given you glory. There's no excuse why you can't live right. Verse 23. I and them and thou and me, that they may be made perfect in one. You're not perfect on your own. If you want to, if you want to do it alone, I'll be, I'll be a, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be right. Nobody else will be, but you can't be because we're only perf perfected as we're one and together, because we all need each other. I can't be perfect without you. You can't be perfect without me. We all need each other. I and them, and thou and me, that they may be perfect in one, that, that, that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and that thou hast loved them, and hast loved me. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am. Praise the Lord. Wherever Jesus is, we're going to be. Wherever, wherever he is, we're going we're gonna to follow him in time and eternity, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. There's another statement on his deity. Love them before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee. Now, the, the word world, we talked about it before. I think if I remember right, shows up 80 times in the book of John. In this chapter alone, it's 19 times. The world shows up 19 times in Jesus' prayer to his Father. You think the world's not a big deal to be separate from? You think it's not a big deal if you're aligned with the world? Jesus is praying to his Father 19 times in this chapter. He says the word world, and it's never in a good context. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. Verse 26, and I have declared unto them thy name. Again, that's not just the name, you know, written on a piece of paper. That's everything who God is. I have declared unto them thy name and will declare it. That the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. Now here is the high mark that the Lord is setting for us, and I'm not standing up here trying, claiming to have attained it, but this is, what, this is what the Lord wants in every one of us. The love that was in Him is in us. Jesus told these disciples in chapter 16 
you're all going to be scattered. You're all going to leave me alone. At my hour of greatest need, you're going to forsake me. When I need you the most, you won't be there. And he still loves them. He is betrayed by Judas Iscariot, and he meets him in the garden and says, Friend, friend, comest thou hither? Nothing these people did ever turned away Jesus' love to them. To, to, to them. And the Lord is praying, and that's how I want your love to be. Look at what it says. That the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be where? In them. And I in them. How many times is our love for people dependent on outside circumstances? How they treat us. How they react to us. If the love is in you, it's not affected by what's outside of you. It's in you. That's what the Lord's getting at. He wants the love to be in us. Unaffected by, by how people treat us. So he says in verse number 8, I have given unto them the words. Verse 14, I have given them thy word. But the final thing he says is, I want the love wherewith thou hast loved me to be in them. And you can learn the word of God a lot quicker than you can learn to love like this. But you can't bypass the word of God to love like this. Because everything in this book is showing, he says in verse 26, I have declared unto them thy name. Everything in this book is declaring who God is. And so the liberal says, I don't need to study the Bible, I just need to love. But you can't get there, it's a process. You've got you've to get the words, you've got to get the word, and over time, Lord willing, you begin to love like this. Go back with me to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. Verse 31. And as ye would that men should do to you, ye also to, ye, do ye also to them likewise. For if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. Anybody can do that. Someone loves you? Okay, so I love them. Great. Sinners can do that. Verse 33. And if ye do good to them which do good to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. And if ye, let, if ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners as much to receive as much again. But love ye your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and ye shall be called the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the end, thankful unto the evil. Now if Jesus... If Jesus only loved those who loved him first, <laughs> we'd all be lost. We'd all be lost. Thank God that the way he was treated didn't affect his love for them. And that's, that's what he's getting at. Go back to John one more time, please. What is he getting at in this prayer and in his instruction to, this, to his disciples? Chapter 14, 15, 16, 17. He's getting at the way you live is based upon your relationship to me, not your relationship to anybody else. Look at chapter 16, John 16, verse 33. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. In me, you can have peace. It doesn't matter what troubles or trials you're going through outside of here. In me, you can have peace. Look at verse, look at again, 1726. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. That's what this whole last several chapters is about. Really, the main thrust of it is the, you being what the Lord wants you to be and me being what the Lord wants me to be regardless of what anybody else says, says or does or how they treat you because your life is lived based on what Jesus is, who he is, how he's loved you. And that's it. That's, that's what he's praying for. It's 26 verses 
26 verses of him praying for us, and it concludes with, I want the love that the Father loved me to be in them. That's what I want. Father, thank you for an opportunity to open up your book this morning. Please bless it, Lord. I can offer no help here, Lord, but you can, and I pray that you would. And I pray that you would help us to receive this, Lord, and to be a little bit closer towards this mark today than we were yesterday. pray in Jesus' name. Amen.